What's the word, y'all? Yoka C Thunder just added an another really big win to their resume. And all season long, I've been watching the Thunder. They're like my favorite team to watch for multiple, multiple reasons. And I see a team that is a contender in there, but in the back of my mind, I think about their youth. As of right now, of course, as you know, they are the fourth youngest team in basketball. Fourth youngest team. And look at who's around. The Pistons are not good. The Spurs are not good. I'm, I'm being nice. The Trailblazers, not good. And then, obviously, we're talking about one seed. The Magic are a good basketball team. The Jazz, maybe not so much anymore. But these teams that they are around, they are leagues and leagues ahead of. And I know this is not rare. This, like You've probably seen this talking point multiple, multiple times throughout the season. Will their inexperience matter? Because if you just close your eyes and look past the fact that that they are all super, super young. They have all of the makings for a team that can win an NBA championship. They have a superstar. Point blank, period. Winning an NBA championship, you need to have a superstar more times than not. They have that as Shea Gilgis Alexander. They have elite level shooting. They are third in the association in three point percentage, only behind the Clippers and the Minnesota Timberwolves. They have an elite level defense, fourth in the association at this moment. They have great depth and they're well coached. What? much more can you ask for for a championship contending team then again you think about the fact that there's only a few players on their roster that have even played in the nba playoff game and a game like last night versus the clippers showcased all of those things and i'm gonna break them down one by one. First one Shea Gilles alexander gave us his prototypical stat line of, of 31 points and some change 31 he always ends up at 31 i know that's the meme but he was amazing um there was a game early in the season where they played against the clippers and there was a lot of conversation about oh the clippers might have a kryptonite to shea gills alexander they threw some bigger defenders on him and he struggled where in this way it didn't matter who was guarding him when he had Kawhi, when he had paul george when he had terrence mann it didn't matter norman powell did a full 360 on a step back Shea got to his spots and shea executed when he got there in this game they shot 17 of 35 from three all season long there's, there have been people saying and, and people speculating that we're going to have some three-point shooting regression from the Thunders because they have too many people shooting career highs. Lou Dort. Lou Dort? Lou Dort shot 30% from three his rookie season, 34% sophomore, then 32, then 33, and now he's sitting at a smooth 39% on five attempts. Shea Gilders Alexander is getting closer and closer to getting back to that 41% three-point shooter we saw in his second year in OKC. And if you look at his last 15 games, he's shooting 53% from three on three attempts. I just don't know how you guard him then. Chet Holmgren, almost 40% from three as a seven foot one rookie center. It goes on and on and on. Aaron Wiggins is a guy that a lot of people uh, said his jump shot was going to be one of the reasons why he may not be a full NBA player, 51% from three. J-Dub, 45%. Isaiah Joe, 43%. Like, I can't believe, Kaysen Wallace, 41%. The shooting regression has never come. Which maybe scares me a little bit because maybe it comes in April. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Or maybe this is just who this team is right now. The defense last night. Amazing. Now, Paul George has been through a major, major slump. I think he's shooting 20-something percent from three in his last 15 games. It's... Whew, it's been kind of rough, but they held Paul George to 14 points, James Harden to 17, only 20 for Kawhi, even though it was an efficient 20. Like, they really defensively stepped up, specifically in that third quarter, where I think they had seven to eight blocks. All of those felt like it was on Zubach. Like, the defense really ramped up, and that is the moment that they pulled away in this game where we got it, where Ch uh, Chet Homer went to the bench, and we get the small ball lineup of Kimmeridge Williams and, jo and Josh Giddy as the four and the five, and they were everywhere. Arms everywhere. Steals, layups, three-point shot, trailer. All of the defense was played. And then we get the depth. In this game, in the first half, Isaiah Joe scored 0-0 zero, zero points in the first half. None. For some reason, Coach Mark Dayton, and this goes hand-to-hand, -hand, we talk about this, this coaching stuff. Coach Mark Dayton, I was like, you know, we're going to start our third quarter with Isaiah Joe on the floor. It had a lot to do with the way the Clippers were covering them. The same way a lot of teams are going to cover them once they play against OKC and Josh Giddey's on the floor. He is a non-threat to all teams across basketball, so we're going to guard him as a non-threat. You know who's a big threat? Isaiah Joe. And in that third quarter, Isaiah Joe hits some big-time threes, some big-time cuts, and play phenomenal defense on, on isolation with James Harden. But Mark Dayton all saw this guy who in this game was had zero points, two fouls, and two turnovers going into halftime. It was like, you know what? He needs to start in this third quarter. And that is the type of depth we talk about with OKC and the type of coaching we talk about with OKC. Not to mention in this one, uh, Kimmeridge Williams was everywhere in his minutes. 
uh, hit a big time corner three, got some steals and so on and so forth. And the depth is only going to get better because Gordon Hayward, who played his first official game, 13 minutes, didn't do much other than get a couple rebounds. But we know Gordon Hayward, once he starts to ease himself back into playing after that injury and then time off, he's going to provide some depth. And they picked up Bismack Biombo, who like the one of the major things, other than the age thing, um, the other major thing around OKC is like, man, they're going to get killed on the glass. They're a smaller team. Bismack Biombo is, if you know, you know, he's he's been a character on my channels um, for years and years and years, but the, the man is a good basketball player. I guess he's been up and down throughout his career, but his last tenure in Memphis early this season, um, this stat right here is how many of the team's missed field goals in the half court that they rebound. So how many offensive rebounds that the team give up when Busy was on the floor? He was in the 94th percentile, which means that, hey, you're not getting an offensive rebound when I'm on the court. Again, it's been ups and downs. The year before that at Phoenix, it was awful, but he's had really good years, and this is one of his really good years when it comes to rebounding or not allowing the opposing team to get rebound. Now, obviously, Busy is not a player that's going to be closing out games. He's not a player that's even going to play huge minutes, but it's just in those those mixed minutes where he's getting you 15 minutes a night in those 15 minutes when you're, you're going super small. You know what I'm saying? I've even seen people talk about a secondary star. I don't know if you've been watching OKC like you, you should be because they have that secondary star. Secondary star. I want to show you something. Now, if you don't know who I was referring to, I was referring to Jalen Williams. Uh, he's averaging 19 points per game, four and a half assists, four rebounds, 50% from the field. But this is, I want to go to his last year, his rookie season stats. I want to show you something ridiculous. So in his first month of his NBA career, he averaged 10 points per game. Second month, 12 points per game. Third month, 13, then 15, then 20. And then you get the three games at the end of the season. Those don't count, those don't count. But in it, his, his last uh, month, last complete month, as a rookie, averaging 20 points per game, right? This year, 15 points per game in the first couple games of the season. Then he went up to 18. Then it was 19. Then it was 20. And right now, he's in the midst of 23 points per game. Are you seeing a pattern about how much better this player has got from week one to week now? And it continues to get better and better and better. And these fourth quarters that Jalen Williams has been able to put together have been phenomenal. Right now, he is 11th in the league in fourth quarter scoring in just nine minutes. Um, and that's 58% from the field, 58% from three. I mean, he's doing it. You know, fourth quarter J-Dub is real. But for some people, everything that I just talked about doesn't matter because they're super young. And I, under I understand it, right? It's rare. It and I mean, extremely, extremely rare that we see a team with zero playoff series wins jump to title contender in one season. So the best example we have that's somewhat similar to this is OKC teams of last, where in 2010, this team made it to the playoffs and lost in the first round to the Lakers. Then the year number two of being together, they made it all the way to the conference finals. And the year number three of being together, they made it to the finals and eventually lost. Now you can look at this a couple different ways. Um, you can say that the current OKC team may not have had that first round exit like we saw the 2010 OKC team uh, do, but they do have postseason or a postseason appearance last year with them being in the play-in. Does that count? We don't know. The only other example I can think of, at least in recent history, is like an OKC, uh, a Warriors team of, of the past, but it's not a one-to-one -one parallel because the 2012-2013 uh, Warriors even got to the second round. And this is year three, Steph Curry. This is rookie Draymond Green in year one, Klay Thompson. The year after that, they made it to the first round two and lost a seven to, OK, uh, to the Clippers. And then we saw them win a championship. So they basically had three years of their core together before they ended up winning a championship. And I would say, okay, see, this is really year one because Chet is that impactful of a player. You know what I'm saying? So it's really just year one of them all coming together. So it's not great one-to-one parallels as far as these super young teams being successful but we do see something that you can squint your eyes and say it's similar now another one of the main things that's going against okc in this conversation is how ridiculous the western conference is the western conference is always ridiculous but particularly ridiculous this year so let's say this is a snapshot let's say the season were to end today right now they would have to play either the suns the kings the lakers and the warrior or the warriors in the first round hello um, uh, Devin Booker is one of the best shooting guards of basketball, if not the best in basketball. Kevin Durant is still magnificent. Bradley Beal, if he's healthy, he's still ridiculous. This team has experience. The Kings may not have a ton of experience with only one playoff uh, series under their belt, but that's more than what OKC's got right now. Obviously, the Lakers won a championship four years ago, and they have uh, Anthony Davis and Braun, and the Warriors have Steph Curry, Draymond, and 
the remainings of, of Clay Thompson. So they're going to be outmatched on experience in all of these. And I'm sure that if the, if one of these series were to happen, they're going to be a lot of experts on TV or panelists. They're going to say, hey, this might be a first round exit for the Oklahoma City Thunder. But let's say they do end up winning that round. Yes, they did it. And now they get to the second round. Guess what? You got to go either against either the Clippers or the Mavs. I mean, you just beat the Clippers two times out of three. Um, and then last time we played the Mavs, they dog y'all. But like, it's going to be a tough path. And let's say you get past them. Now you got to go against either the Nuggets or the Timberwolves in the conference finals. And then if you get past one of them, you got to go against one of these teams. Probably the Celtics. Probably. The path could not be more difficult. Especially for a young team that hasn't had to really get down to that nitty gritty for a seven game series before. I'm extremely excited to see if they can do it. I still don't know if I put them as like one of the real contenders for everything that I just said, but I'm excited to figure out what's right and what's wrong.